Thank you for volunteering to be part of our board and commission. I'm Kristen Downs, your city secretary, and today myself and the city attorney will be providing you with some more information on our board and commissions. Some of the skills that you need to volunteer are commitment, strong work ethic, and compassion for our city. City boards, commissions, and committees are essential in advising the city council on a variety of issues. The majority of appointments are for two-year terms. Most do not have term limits, although a few have three-year commitments. Terms are staggered, with half of the memberships being appointed each year. And we do make appointments annually. Our advisory boards advise the city council on public policy and play a very important role in city government by providing the council with creative ideas feedback, and by serving as a sounding board for proposed public policy. Our advisory boards are as followed. Park and Recreation Advisory Board, Library Advisory Board, Keep Duncanville Beautiful Board, Duncanville Neighborhood Vitality Commission, Multicultural Social Engagement Partnership, Regional Animal Shelter Board, also known as our Tri-Cities Board, and the Audit Committee. Our decision-making boards also known as our quasi-judicial boards, are governed by state law and, and are set or enforce public policy and are potentially subject to review by the courts. Members are required to take an oath in office and are subject to the Texas Open Meetings Act and the Texas Public Information Act. Our quasi-judicial boards are as follows. City Planning and Zoning Board, Zoning Board of Adjustment, Sign Control Board, Duncanville Community and Economic Development Corporation, the DCEDC Board, and the TIF Board. Our Civil Service Commission performs judicial, executive, and legislative functions. They are beyond an advisory board. Conflict of interest. If a member has a conflict of interest regarding any item that is presented or required to be presented to the body for discussion or approval, the member must one, file a written statement to disclose the conflict of interest. Two, abstain from any discussion on the matter with city staff or any other members. And three, recuse themselves from the meeting when the item is being discussed or considered by the body. A local public official has a conflict of interest in a matter if any action in the matter would involve a business entity or real property in which the official has a substantial interest an action of the matter would confer an economic benefit on the official. Our city attorney will provide more information on conflict of interest later on in this presentation. The city of Duncanville is a home rule city. So what does that mean? State law provides that cities have more than 5,000 inhabitants may by a majority vote of the qualified voters adopt a home rule charter. The city of Duncanville adopted a home rule charter providing for a council manager, manager form of government in 1962. As prescribed by the home rule charter, all powers of the city are vested in the elective council, which enacts local legislation, adopts budgets, determines policies, appoints the judge of the municipal court, appoints the city attorney, and appoints our city manager. The required training for our board and commissions are as follows. Our Texas um, Public Information Act, our Texas Open Meetings Act, and any local training. Our board and commission members must complete the Public Information and Open Meetings Act training course, not less than one hour of training. Our quasi-judicial boards and our civil service board are required to take an oath in office within 90 days of their appointment. Our local training will now consist of this training video that myself and the city attorney are providing today and any training from your staff liaisons. Now the Open Meetings Act and the Public Information Act are both intended to make government more accessible to the public. However, these are two completely separate statutes and operate independently of each other. Now, if you have not completed your um, Open Meetings Act or your um, public information training, or you're just unsure if you've completed it or not, please do not hesitate to reach out to me and um, we will work closely together to make sure that you're, you're current. Public information. It's also known as my open records. 
Public information includes an information that is collected, assembled, or maintained by or for a governmental entity, including information held by an individual officer or employee in transaction of official business, regardless of the format. General rule, most information held by a city or a city official or employee is presumed to be public information and must be released pursuant to a written request. Now our Open Meetings Act. Every regular special or call meeting of a governing body is open to the public unless a closed meeting is authorized by the act. Governing bodies includes quasi-judicial boards and commissions, but not advisory boards. Bodies subject to the act. Every city council planning and zoning, 4A and 4B boards, board of adjustment, building and standards commission, Advisory board, commission, or committee, such as the library board, which has no authority over the public business or policy, is not so subject to the Open Meetings Act. Committees consisting of members of the governing body, even though less than a quorum, are subject to the act when the committee meets to discuss public business. By local city policy, all board and commissions must follow the act. Require notice by the Open Meetings Act. 72 hours prior written notice of the date, hour, place, and subject of each meeting, including authorized closed meetings with the exception of the closed meeting for consultation with an attorney. Notice must be sufficient to inform the public of the subject, subject matter that the governing body will consider in an open or closed meeting. The city slash entity that maintains an internet website is required to post notice of its meeting on its web website. If the city has a population of 48,000 or more, the city must post their meeting agendas on our website. Robert's Rules of Orders. Robert's Rules of Order establish an orderly protocol by which meetings can be conducted. The intent is to ensure an orderly and dignified proceeding in which collective decisions can be made efficiently and fairly. Robert's rules are not law. A deviation from the rules will not invalidate a decision. State law suggests that so long as a quorum is present, the meeting was properly posted and conducted as an open meeting, and the minutes clearly reflect that a majority voted in favor of or against a specific issue then the vote will typically stand. However, virtually all councils, boards, and commissions follow at least the rudiments described in the rules. The chairperson as a presiding officer has the primary responsibility for maintaining the dignity of the meeting and seeing to it that the rules of procedure are followed. The chairperson calls the meeting to order and confines the discussion to the agreed order of business. He or she recognizes members for motions and discussions and allows audience participation at appropriate times. The chairperson sees to it that speakers limit their remarks to the item being considered and as necessary, calls down people who are out of order. For citing effectively at a meeting is an art that no book or person can fully teach. The tactful presiding officer knows how to courteously discourage members who talk too much or too often and how to encourage shy members who are hesitant to speak at all. He or she can also properly regulate the manner and duration citizens speaking during public hearings. Time limits can be opposed or disregarded where appropriate and verbally aggressive speakers can be calmed. The basic process for decision-making is straightforward and involves discussions. A motion, a second, and a vote. The chair entertains a motion from a member. The chair should only entertain or call for a motion and should not make a motion him or herself. The chair then calls for a second if one is not volunteered. If no second is made, the motion dies for lack of a second and the chair then calls for another motion. If none is made, then the, sh the chair should entertain additional discussion on the matter. If no further motion is made, then the chair should simply move on to the next agenda item. Once a motion and second have been made, the chair then calls the question. The vote of each member must be clear. 
Apart from Robert's rules, state law requires that the minutes of the meeting accurately reflect the vote of each individual member and the, vo and the votes must be observable by those in attendance. In other words, secret ballots are prohibited. Those voting can be accomplished by a show of hands, a voice vote or an electronic display that identifies the vote of each member. However, voting cannot be done, for example, by paper ballots that are turned into the chair for tallying, unless the chair reads each member's name and vote out loud. Discussion of a matter under Robert's rules occurs only after a motion has been made and seconded. However, this is often impractical. Often a member will make a motion only to enable the board to advance to discussion. And members may not see the wisdom in making a motion until the issue has been thoroughly discussed. Thus, discussion often occurs before a motion is made. However, whether discussion should occur before or after the motion or second is a matter of procedure that the chairperson or the board as a whole determines. Calling the question means nothing more than asking for the members to vote. After a motion has been seconded and following any discussion, the chair calls the question by asking those in favor of the motion to vote, counting those votes, then asking those against to vote and counting those votes. All members must vote in the open. The, meetings of the, the minutes of the meeting must accurately state the motion and must identify those members who voted in favor or those who voted against. So what is a quorum? the minimum number of members of a body necessary to conduct business of that group. So basically this means half plus one. Seven members of a committee, you need to have four members to make a quorum. If you have 10 members on your committee, you need to have six members to make a quorum. And if you have five members on your committee, then you need three to make a quorum. Avoid a walk-in quorum. This is basically discussion made outside of an open meeting that was scheduled. Um, so when you receive emails from your staff liaisons about your upcoming agenda or approval of minutes or whatever the case may be, you may notice that your blind, your BCC, your blind copied on the email. Um, this is to protect y'all. If for some reason you are not blind copied, please do not hit reply all. If you hit reply all and then your next um, committee member hits reply all and then your committee of seven and now four of y'all are talking back and forth, you have now entered into a walking quorum and this is not good. So please do not hit reply all to your emails when everybody is involved in that email. This also goes for social media posts too. So let's say you're the um, Keep Duncanville Beautiful Board and y'all are having a cleanup event and one of you goes and um, y'all share a social media post about the event. Do not go on there as your committee and start replying to the citizens and underneath the comments, um, whether the citizens are upset or they agree with the event, whatever the the discussion of topic is, it doesn't matter. Please do not start replying on the comment section because like I said, this is the same as with the emails. If four of y'all start replying, then now y'all are in a walking quorum. And I understand y'all aren't doing it to, to break any laws or whatever the case may be. You're probably just giving the good information for the citizens. However, you're now in an open meeting and we have nothing posted and we can get in trouble legally. Um, we, as in your board and the city. Um, this also goes for, let's say you have run into one of your committee members at the grocery store or you're good friends with them and you pick up the phone and y'all end up talking about maybe your um, KDB a bit. Um, you need to make it known that, hey, I have talked with so-and-so also about this topic and um, I've talked with you. So that means now three of y'all have discussed the same topic. It is very important that those other two members do not go out and talk to another committee member because now you're in a walking forum. Even though the four of y'all aren't together, you talk to somebody who talked to somebody who talked to somebody in that committee and now y'all are in a walking forum. I know this is very confusing, 
And I know it's very hard to understand because um, it's confusing for us too. However, please let's try to avoid a walking quorum as mu much as possible. We want to keep everybody safe and legal. And um, so just don't hit reply all. Watch what you're posting on social media. Yes, you can share the events on social media. Just don't start the discussion. And if, and if you do talk to other people, please, as a committee, y'all recognize how many committee members have spoken on this topic and y'all stop to make sure that y'all don't make a quorum. And I will now uh, give this over to our city attorney so they can talk more about boarding commissions. Good afternoon, my name is Shelby Piercy and I'm with the law firm of Nichols Jackson, Dillard, Hager and Smith. Uh, we represent the city of Duncanville as the city attorney. And today I'm going to be going through a ethics public information and the Open Meetings Act uh, for all of you who are on boards, commissions, or committees of the city. Every single member should be knowledgeable about the ethical obligations and duties uh, that are required of you under local law, under state law. More broadly, state law covers the conflicts of interest and conflicts disclosure requirements in chapters 171 and 176. Now, what is a conflict of interest? A substantial interest is considered if you own 10% or more of a voting stock or share of a business, if you own 10% or more, or over $15,000 of the fair market value of a business or property, or if you receive funds from the business that add up to over 10% of your gross income for the last 12 months. Now, this also applies if you're a relative within the first degree of blood or marriage, uh, if they have a substantial interest as defined in this slide, then that interest imputes to you. A relative within the first degree is going to include siblings, Step siblings, step stepdaughter, stepsons, obviously spouse, mother, father, child. The statute requires that you disclose that you have a conflict of interest and that you have no further participation in deliberation. It does not mean that you have to leave the meeting. The member can stay as long as they stay silent during any deliberations. A conflict of interest disclosure statement required if you or your family member has a relationship with a vendor for the city uh, that receives more than $2,500 of taxable income in the past year. Uh, this does not apply to investment income only. So if you have investment income coming in and you don't have any other taxable income, then this would not apply. You or your family member accept a gift from a vendor that is valued at over $100. This would include transportation, lodging, and entertainment, but it does not include gifts that are considered merely political contributions or items such as food. And lastly, you would have to make a conflict of interest disclosure statement if uh, you have a family member who is a vendor, a uh, potential vendor for the city. Now on to open records. <clears throat> open records are uh, dealt with on a daily basis with the city. Chapter 552 of the government code is the Public Information Act and it applies to all governmental entities and it does apply to those members who sit on boards and commissions. There are certain exceptions to the Public Information Act that we will go through. And ultimately, if an exception applies, the Attorney General's Office is the one who decides whether the city can release the information. Now, all requests must be in writing. Uh, all back and forth clarifications, follow-ups should all be in writing. Uh, nobody can come up to the city and verbally ask for information. They have to be in writing and to a particular person 
when the request is received is very, very important because as you will see during this presentation, deadlines are strict, they're quick. So it's best to have a date stamp. If the request was received after hours, so if a request comes in on Friday at 5.04, then that is not deemed to be received by the city until the next business day, which is typically going to be Monday. Now, as far as what is considered public information, it's going to be information that is already in existence. So the city is not required to prepare new information. They are not required to uh, do legal research and they are not required to answer questions. So if a document or a record does not exist to answer the person's question, then the, the response is that there is no record. Now, sometimes the city will, as a courtesy to the public and in the public's interest, will do things such as compile a list, uh, so long as it's not something that is going to be taking up hours and hours of the city's time then it can be reasonable for the city to go ahead and uh, put that information together. Now, recently in uh, 2019, a new law passed making items and records that are uh, sent and received on personal devices and in personal email, personal text messages, are, are considered public information. Now, what this means as a member of a board or commission of the city is that if you are sending a text message or an email, you're using a personal computer, personal device, and that has to do with official city business. You need to retain that information. You cannot destroy it. You can't delete it. And it needs to be read, readily available if a person from the public asks for that information. A best practice is to keep things separate and then to have a form or a method or procedure of uh, retaining any information that is sent from a personal device. So sometimes if um, most board members, uh, council members, committee members are probably not going to have a city issued email because they're not employees of the city. So it might be best practice to have a separate email separate from your personal email that you use to conduct official city business. If you receive a <clears throat> request that has come in uh, by the and the city secretary has sent this to you, you've been asked to compile your responsive information. You want to identify the responsive information and hopefully after this presentation, you'll be familiar with what kind of information is accepted from a uh, public release. And you would still release that information over to the city secretary, her designee, or to the city attorney's office and notify them of what kind of exceptions you think apply. Now, it's important to remember that you can't alone determine whether or not the information is confidential. So all that information has to either be turned over to the city secretary to determine that the uh, city attorney's office or ultimately to the attorney general's office. There are criminal penalties uh, with violations of the act. Uh, there are two categories of criminal penalties for releasing information that was not supposed to be released and for destroying, altering, or concealing public records that were supposed to be retained or re otherwise released. Now, I talked about deadlines and the urgency involved with these requests. There is a 10 business day deadline from the date that the request is first received. So you have to gather all the responsive information as soon as possible and be very cognizant of how much time you're looking at. There is one exception <clears throat> at request for body-worn camera recordings do have a 20-day deadline. 
However, we usually don't follow the 20 days. We usually keep within the 10 days because typically those requests come in uh, in conjunction with other requests. So they're asking for body camera incident reports. It's easier for the city to take care of the request as a whole, but uh, it's always good to know that you do have the 20 business days. So within the 10 days, you need to either release the information or tell the requester, we anticipate this is going to take us two weeks to compile and redact and put this information together for you or get it ready for you, copy it, whatever needs to be done. So it needs to either be released promptly. Uh, if you are not going to release the information, then you need to write to the AG. The city needs to write to the AG within that 10 business days. And that uh, correspondence to the attorney general does need to be copied to the requester. Now, an example of the time frame here is say that it was received Monday the 2nd. You're going to count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So you're not counting weekends. If the 9th was hypothetically a holiday, and then the request was received on the 6th at 5.04 p.m. It was received by the city on the 10th because you don't count the 9th, which was a holiday, and it was received after hours on the 6th. So you'll start on the 10th and you'll count 10 days from there. Now, say that the, uh, the city is closed because of a giant ice storm. It's closed on the 10th and the 11th and the 12th. You don't count those days. So if you do need more time, and this happens a lot because there's only so much city staff, there are only so many attorneys to review information, and uh, you do have the option to send a letter to the attorney general within that 10 days requesting five additional business days. So it's not a huge extension, but it is an extension. Uh, you do have to put in at least a broad statement of, of why the information is going to be withheld, and you do have to copy the requester on that. Now, a lot of times a requester will send a request in that either doesn't make sense, it's overly broad, it doesn't have a time frame, it doesn't it doesn't reasonably identify the information that the city staff needs to start collecting. Within that 10-day time frame, you can ask the requester to clarify or narrow their request. Uh, what this does is it stops the 10-day clock and it restarts it once you get a response from it. Once there is a reasonable, reasonably clear request, then that 10-day will start again. Examples of a request for clarifications. So somebody requests all communications during a 60-day period. We're going to ask them to narrow by providing either a subject matter, subject matter, or a recipient or author of those communications. Voluminous requests, uh, requests that are going to require a lot of time from staff. If the charges are going to exceed $40, the city is required to give an itemized statement of the estimated charges before any work is undertaken. And this is a good thing for the city because then they don't have to waste any time uh, compiling information if the requester is going to, say, then going to come back and say, oh, I, I don't want to pay for it. So if there are other options, uh, for example, coming in and inspecting the records, you have to give them that option. If there is, we always give them the option to narrow their request. Now, what you can charge for copies, uh, labors, typically what is charged in these for staff to locate, compile, and redact any confidential information. And then whatever the labor is, uh, you know, say it's 10 hours, $150, you can, uh, you then put a 20% labor charge uh, on that $150. If media has to go on a DVD or a flash drive, it would be the actual cost of medium. 
if the requester asks specifically asks for the information to be mailed to them, they're going to be responsible for posted charges and statutorily an accident report does assess a charge of $6. Uh, on to exceptions. So there's different kinds of exceptions. There are exceptions that require a, an opinion from the attorney general. There are other exceptions that the city can redact or otherwise withhold that information without sending a letter to the attorney general. Examples of this are social security numbers, driver's license, license plate, bed numbers, passport numbers or information, personal information about a peace officer, fingerprints, uh, email addresses of members of the public, which is probably one that you would come into, uh, that would come into play with any information that would be in your possession. So with the peace officer information, uh, this does apply whether or not the, a, a peace officer requests their information to be private. It does not include code officers or animal control. It's only uh, licensed peace officers their home address, home phone number, personal cell phone number, and of course, whether the officer has any family members. So whether they have children, even parents, uh, spouse names, and uh, emergency contact as well. Other items that can be redacted or withheld without the need to write the attorney general are direct deposit forms, or even just whether the employee uh, requests or is having their, um, their salary or their pay put into uh, a checking account or direct deposited. Employee uh, eligibility verification forms, W-2, W-4 forms, uh, certified agendas and recordings of executive sessions. Uh, those can only be released by court order. Anything having to do with medical, uh, medical records, uh, reports of injuries, workers' compensation, and then uh, most recently, utility customer billing and usage information. So uh, names and addresses uh, and account numbers for, for customers of the city's utilities. Uh, employee and official personal information. So similar to the uh, licensed peace officer information, except the employee or a public official does have to either elect to keep it confidential or elect to have their information publicly available. And this would include home address, home telephone number, emergency contact information, social security number, any information that reveals identity of or whether the person has family members, and then uh, Access device numbers, this is going to include checking account numbers, fi any financial account numbers that gives access to any kind of services of value. Normal, normally when a personnel file is, uh, is requested, we look for certain information that's going to be in there. We, we obviously look for the personal information now this is going to cover former and current employees. So even though the person is no longer employed with the city, their information is still uh, subject to being withheld if they did make that election. Uh, driver's license information, social security number, their date of birth, and then anything personal or embarrassing in their personnel file. In, in this kind of situation, you're kind of making a judgment call, and typically it's going to be our office that's making that, but it's always good to look out for and to be aware of it. Um, medical records, medical history, criminal history, credit history, uh, and then drug or alcohol test results can also be withheld within a personnel file. Now, when you are releasing information, there's, there's no requirement for the city to do any kind of after hours work. They can make the information available dur during normal business hours. And the requester, of course, is not allowed to take an original public record from the city. It must be copied. If the city does determine that there is information that needs to be withheld and that they can't just withhold it, 
uh, under those exceptions that I pointed out that do not require an attorney general opinion, then they do have to write to the attorney general. In that request for a decision, they have to list all, all exceptions that they believe apply. That request for an opinion has to be copied on the requester. Now, certain parts of the request for opinion can be redacted. If part of that request is going, might reveal some of the information that is confidential, but that letter does have to be provided to the requester. And again, within that 10 days. Now, if the city does fail to request a decision from the uh, AG, the information is presumed to be public. There is an exception to this but there has to be a compelling reason. And usually there is a compelling reason if the information is confidential information of a third party. So it's not information that is only pertains to the city. Uh, for example, you know, notes or memoranda, working memoranda uh, that hasn't been finalized by the city. That is more of a discretionary exception but if you hold account numbers of an employee or email addresses of members of the public, you now have third-party interests involved. And typically, even though the city missed their deadline, they can still ask for that withholding by telling the attorney general that there is a compelling reason because that information belongs to a third party. The AG typically has 45 days to respond to the request, and once the city receives that request back, they, they are to notify the requester of the result of that opinion, and if there's any additional information that the city does have to release according to that opinion, they would do it at that time. So there are different categories of exceptions under the Public Information Act. You're going to have state and federal statutes. So, for example, HIPAA is a federal statute. There are certain codes under the uh, under the Family Code, the Utilities Code, the Tax Code that would apply. Then you have your uh, judicial decision, constitutional, constitutional, and common law privacy. And this means that there has been a case, and there's actually been a court that has issued a decision or an opinion stating that certain information is, they have a constitutional right to privacy. Common law and constitutional privacy, this is gonna be determined by the attorney general. It's gonna be determined by the actual attorney general's opinion. So I'll get more into this here shortly, kind of an umbrella to cover just certain information that the majority of the public would consider to be private and confidential. One exception that we deal with quite a bit, but is also uh, also kind of carries a heavy burden, is the pending litigation exception. Now, if there is information that's requested that directly relates to pending litigation, meaning that the city is a party, either as a plaintiff or defendant, and discovery has not been exchanged by the parties, then we can raise this exception as to not unduly interfere with the litigation or as the city's interest is involved, allow for litigation to go forward without the public litigating it themselves. There's also the anticipated litigation, which means that it, litigation isn't pending, no lawsuit has been filed, but the city reasonably anticipates there to be litigation. Now this can be a lot easier to prove if it's the city that's going to be the plaintiff. But I find that this burden is really hard to, re to reach as a defendant or as a potential defendant, meaning that we have requests that come in for information and there have been threats of a lawsuit. There have been an insurance claim or a demand letter from an attorney's office. And from our perspective, we believe that there's going to be litigation. But the AG's office is, is very strict in construing this and they don't always find in our favor. So if you have any information, if you have written threats, if you have somebody who is 
said, I've hired an attorney. I, all that information is, is helpful uh, for this if we do want to withhold the information, but keep in mind, it's a hard burden to reach. So information relating to competition or bidding and trade secrets and commercial and financial information of third-party vendors. Uh, the, these first two, 104 and 110, are very common. 104 is an exception that's used by the city. So this is an exception that says, listen, we don't want this, uh, these proposals released because it could put us in a, in a compromised situation in future bid negotiations, and it could just interfere with uh, potential future bidding. 110 is to protect the vendor's information. So a lot of times these vendors provide us with uh, information that, that involves trade secrets, uh, proprietary information, financial information, and sometimes copywritten information. So in this case, these, this 10 days gets a lot shorter because we have to send letters that we have to notify the vendors within that 10 days. We have to notify them and tell them this is the information that's been requested, and this is your information, and this is what you can do to keep it confidential. And you have to write the attorney general, and uh, we, ha we have to write the attorney general as well and let them know that we've notified the vendor. So if you're ever given this, make sure to get your information together as fast as possible because this is a very short deadline for the kind of work that has to go into it. 552.111 is for basically for city work product. So uh, say that you're working on the budget. There's a lot of memos going back and forth. The budget hasn't been approved. It hasn't, uh, hasn't gotten into its final form yet, but somebody has requested all of that information that has been created in the deliberative process of putting that budget together it can be withheld under 552.111. And a lot of times is because it, there's all different reasons why the city would wanna keep that confidential, but um, for purposes of the act, only that information that is in its final format is considered public information. 552.107 is gonna be attorney client privilege, which I will address uh, with a little more specificity. 552.13.31 is a new one, and this is utility information that has to do with utility disconnections, past due accounts, or accounts that are eligible for disconnection. The exception list is very, very long. Uh, it's, it's pretty impossible to cover everything, but there is a, a very useful Public Information Act handbook that's available online. If you want to bookmark it and you ever have a, a question about it, you can type in a couple of keywords, see if it comes up. Uh, and if you're ever unsure about whether an exception applies, contact the city attorney or contact our office. So a lot of the requests that we get are to the police department, which may not affect you, but it's still very important to understand what can be released and what cannot. So the law enforcement exception is a broad exception under 552.108. It is discretionary, meaning the, the police department doesn't have to use these. They don't have to withhold this information, but they can if they want to, if it's in their best interest. The first and most common one is 552-108-A1, which is pending investigation or prosecution. The majority of the time when records are requested from the police department, they're either still pending investigation or they're pending prosecution. So this is one that is very commonly used. Now, the other that is also very commonly used is an investigation that did not result in conviction or probation. This would mean that the the case was dismissed, the prosecution or the state rejected the charge or any other plethora of reasons, the, the charges never got to a point where there was a plea, a conviction or a deferred adjudication probation. 
those records can be withheld. Internal records of law enforcement for internal use, this is uh, typically used for firearm serial numbers, video surveillance uh, within the jail, anything that has to do with officer safety. So even policies and procedures of the police department having to do with tactical responses, uh, cybersecurity. When you do use the the law enforcement exception, you can't withhold everything. And that is if you're only using the law enforcement exception. You do still have to release what is referred to as the basic information. So it's the who, what, when, and where. It's very brief. Usually it's the first Uh, the first paragraph of a narrative, or uh, sometimes that information is just available on the call card, but it's, you know, who's the suspect, who's the victim, what's the alleged conduct, where did it happen, when did it happen, and that's about it. There's also uh, a little bit more, if if the person is, is, if somebody's arrested, you have to include the just details around the arrest. There, There really isn't a whole lot that needs to be released as far as the basic information is concerned. Criminal informants and the physical safety doctrine. This does not mean that this only applies to your typical criminal informants where they're working with the, you know, they're working undercover with their crime syndicate and with the police and they're bringing information back to the police. This is as, as uh, minuscule as the neighbor who reports their barking dog. The city believes that they're might be a situation where there might be retaliation or there might be a a situation where there might be some sort of a threat, then the city can raise the criminal informants privilege. They can also raise the physical safety. Now, criminal informants has more to do with identity. Physical safety doctrine has more to do with location of crime victims. So when you have a stalking or harassment case and person requesting it is aware of the identity of the uh, the victim, but they may not know where they're located or who they associate with or where they work. We would use that to protect that individual's, individual's in information and to protect their physical safety. A request for body camera video has to be very precise. There has to be a date, an approximate time of recording or time frame specific location where the recording occurred, and the name of one or more persons known to be the subject of the recording. If one of these is missing from a request, the city can withhold all of it. Accident reports, there are two categories of requesters, so they're either entitled to the full report without any redactions, uh, and this would include DPS, a court, uh, anyone involved in the accident, a vehicle owner whose vehicle was, or insurance policy holder whose vehicle was damaged, the radio or television. And then of course, there are the requesters that are entitled to a redacted report. And there is a laundry list of information that has to be redacted from it, uh, including whether anybody was transported to a medical facility, the time that the officer arrived on the scene or was notified of it, And then, of course, your normal identifiers, which would be driver's license, date of birth, insurance policy, juvenile suspects. Anytime a juvenile child under the age of 18 at the time of the incident uh, was a suspect or a runaway, uh, we do have to withhold the entire report. We can disclose that information to the child Uh, the child's attorney, or in most cases, it's going to be the child's parent. But juvenile criminal suspect information is one of the most highly protected information there is. With that, another family code exception is reports of child abuse or neglect. And generally, the entire report is confidential. And the information can be released to a parent so long as they're not the alleged perpetrator of the neglect or the abuse. So sometimes you'll have situations where when you, when we review the report, uh, both the parents are the alleged perpetrators, maybe one of abuse and one of the neglect, but the information can't go to either parents. 
common law right to privacy. This is that umbrella that I was talking about earlier. This is information that would contain highly intimate or embarrassing facts about a person's private affairs and is of no legitimate concern to the public. I recently had one that didn't fall under your typical common law right to privacy scenarios. And it was a situation where a uh, an ex-boyfriend had published uh, revenge porn or had published some nude photos on Twitter of the, of the ex-girlfriend. And in the review of that, we believed that the fact that there were nude pictures of that person was of no legitimate concern to the public and was something that was very intimate about that person's private affairs. So we sent it off to the attorney general. The attorney general's office agreed with us. Like I said before, birth dates are common law right to privacy, medical history, criminal history, employee drug and alcohol test results, and certain personal financial information, so long as that is not relating to a financial transaction between an individual and the governmental body. Death scene photos. So uh, one thing to keep in mind is that when somebody dies, their uh, right to privacy dies with them. There is, it, it lapses at death. So their date of birth, their social security number, driver's license numbers, there is no longer a right to privacy. There is, however, a right to privacy that passes to the next of kin. Most commonly, we have, we have sensitive crime scene photos that we will notify the next of kin. This has been requested by the public. And then they have the opportunity to ask the attorney general to withhold that information. It's not just sensitive crime scene information. Uh, A lot of times we deal with this with suicide or overdoses, uh, just because that is uh, highly intimate and of typically considered private for the family. And so those are situations as well that we will contact the next of kin. Uh, Organ donor election, uh, suicide attempts and threats, anything having to do with mental health, nudity, uh, any kind of sexually based offenses, uh, especially if there is a victim, victim of sexual crime that is identified in the report. We all always like to keep that, uh, always have to keep that confidential. Attorney-client privilege, this is one that you will probably be faced with because there will likely be emails or other correspondence between our firm and yourself uh, regarding uh, city business. And uh, sometimes those do not necessarily suffice as privileged communications. So it's important to look at the communication and flag it so that it can be reviewed by our firm uh, before it is released. On to open meetings. Each and every board and commission in the city of Duncanville is going to be subject to the Open Meetings Act. So you need to make yourself very familiar with it. When does it apply? It's going to apply whenever you have a deliberation between a quorum of the members of the board or commission during which public business is discussed or formal action might be taken. And to whom does it apply? Like I said, by charter in Duncanville, all boards and commissions are going to be subject to the act and must follow it. In general, judicial and quasi-judicial boards and commissions are subject to the Open Meetings Act. So it's boards and commissions that have any kind of power to take formal action Purely advisory boards are not subject to the act in general, 
if they are just providing advice and they have actual, they do not have any decision making authority. But advisory boards whose advice is routinely approved without much deliberation or discussion or otherwise rubber stamped by council, those advisory boards would then be subject to the Open Meetings Act. So what would be uh, situations in which the members would not be subject to the act? Uh, social, uh, social gatherings that are unrelated to public business where you're not discussing, discussing decisions or making any deliberations, consultations with the city attorney, and then at an open meeting, but in which case there has not been notice for these particular items and it's reports of community interest. So it would include congratulations, recognition of citizens, recognition of employees or public officials and discussion or announcements related to holiday schedules and community or social events. Notice of a public meeting must be in writing and posted not less than 72 hours before the beginning of the meeting. It must be posted at a place that's accessible to the public, as well as on the city's website. The notice must include the date, hour, place, and any actions under consideration. So the subject matter of what is going to be discussed and or deliberated. Now, how specific does the uh, subject matter of a item on the agenda need to be? It's not completely clear from case law. What has been considered not specific enough would be statements like old business, new business, litigation matters, personnel matters. For example, you would want to put employment of utility personnel. Courts have found that employment of personnel by itself was uh, sufficient for posting, but in other situations, they have found that it is insufficient, that it needs to have a title, especially if it's a larger, more important title, like a superintendent, for example. In general, the more important the subject is to the community, the more specific it should be. Now, with regard to deliberations, you do not deliberate by phone, by email, or voicemail. All deliberations must take place in a public meeting setting at City Hall, live broadcast. This is what we would refer to as a walking quorum. It's when you have members meeting in separate meetings, but always in numbers less than a quorum for the purpose of secretive deliberation. So they're never quite in a quorum. They're deliberating in smaller groups for the purpose of circumventing the Open Meetings Act. Of the presently, during the pandemic, certain portions of the Open Meetings Act have been suspended temporarily for purposes of social distancing and whatnot and they have loosened some of the requirements regarding video conferencing. The Open Meetings Act does require or does allow a meeting to be held via video conference. However, a quorum must be present at one location. So you can have, uh, if a quorum is five members, for example, then you can have five members meeting at City Hall and then you can have an additional member or two members or three coming in and appearing via video conference, but you must have a quorum present at one location. The notice for the meet for the video conference has to specify the location where the quorum is present. And that location must be open to the public. Additionally, with the uh, with a video conference meeting, it has to be recorded. 
uh, it, and it can just be an audio recording and it also must be broadcast live. There are a lot of other requirements regarding there must be two-way audio with regards to other members and uh, any, any required staff that are appearing via video conference. And the public must be able to reasonably hear and see all deliberations without undue interference. All deliberation has to be made in public. No voting in closed sessions. There can be certain discussions that I will go into here shortly regarding action items in closed sessions, but there cannot be any kind of deliberation or voting during that closed session. All voting has to be made public. The public needs to be able to see how each member voted. Closed meetings or executive sessions can be standalone or they can, they can occur during a regular meeting. They are limited to specific purposes. Seeking advice from the city attorney is one of the most common reasons for an executive session. Personnel matters, real estate, economic development, So the procedure for closed meeting that you open a public meeting first and you announce that the council is going to convene into a closed meeting and state the applicable sections of the government code and reasons for the executive session. During the executive session, a certified agenda is kept. If a certified agenda is not kept, it does have to be recorded. The certified agenda can only be released by court order. It's not something that is available to the public, for example, under the Public Information Act. No action is taken during executive session. Now, if it's properly noticed on the agenda, action can be taken after they reconvene into regular open session, but no action can be taken during the closed session. And no decisions can be made, no votes can be tallied or pulled. All decision-making, deliberation, and voting must happen in the public. Now, typically, the city attorney will be keeping the certified agenda. The attendance during executive sessions should always be limited to only those people that are necessary. So with the consultation with an attorney, typically the situation is discussing a settlement offer, giving updates regarding pending litigation, discussing contemplated litigation and getting legal advice. If during a public meeting, the need for advice comes up, they can convene into a closed meeting to seek that advice. For personnel matters, this can be to discuss hiring, to uh, interview, to discuss discipline or dismissal of an officer. The agenda does not have to name the officer that is being discussed. However, if an officer knows that they're being discussed, they are the subject to the deliberation, they can make a request to make that closed meeting open. And if they do make that request, it has to be, it has to be in an open meeting setting. Now, economic development, this is uh, discussions regarding prospective commercial or financial information and offers of incentives to a prospect. Notice does not have to specifically identify the business prospect. Another situation uh, that is pretty common for closed meetings is discussion on the purchase or sale of real estate. And the purpose of discussing this in a closed session would be if the public discussion of it would disadvantage the city's ability to negotiate either the sale or the purchase of the property. Now, recently they have expanded the act to allow for discussion of uh, security matters with the rise of infrastructure breaches and uh, cyber threats. This has become more necessary 
in the government setting. Now, citizens' appearances are very common during, during public hearings, but it is up to the city if they want to allow for uh, citizen appearances for open comment. And usually this happens uh, towards the beginning of the meeting and the public has, has a right to speak on any matter that they choose. Matters cannot be deliberated or discussed, and typically the members will stay silent during this public comment section. The content of public comments cannot be limited, but there can be a time limitation. For example, uh, they can put a three minute limitation on each person's comment. In public hearings, they may decide to put a hour limit on the total comments if it happens to be a public hearing. Now the result of any violations of the Open Meetings Act is that the any action taken during that meeting that was in violation of the act are voidable. They're not void, but they are voidable, meaning that if as a consequence of the violation, those acts could be overturned. They can be set aside by a court, but then they can cure that by having a subsequent meeting that is not in violation of the act. Members who are involved in walking quorums, they commit a misdemeanor offense. You never want to knowingly circumvent the act by making deliberations or discussing public business in groups just smaller than a quorum. In addition to violations of open meetings and notice violations, a disclosure of the certified agenda or a recording of the closed meeting executive session is a misdemeanor. And there is liability to any person who is injured by that disclosure. Due to the underlying nature of an executive session, members should make it a practice not to discuss what was discussed during a closed meeting, especially when those discussions typically involve, involve attorney-client privilege and legal advice. Before we get into legislative updates, some quick, just simple do's and don'ts when it comes to open meetings. Don't communicate with other members outside of a public meeting with the intention of persuading them to vote a certain way. And this includes email and phone calls. Do not vote in, in executive sessions. Do not poll people in executive sessions. And do not debate issues that are raised during public comment period unless it has been placed on the agenda. Thank you.